That's what we think about this time of year. Great prophecy. Remember, what I'm getting ready to read, read to you was written 700 B.C. 700 years. That'd be like from now, it'd be uh, um, uh, 1,300. Somebody wrote this and it happened in 2,000. 700 years ahead of time. One of the sure ways we know the Bible is true is its ability to predict the future. No other religious book can do that. They can guess at it once in a while and might look up and get it right. But the Bible, uh, people don't realize, do you realize when the Lord came the first time and there was like 300 prophecies made of his first and second coming, even more than that, and all the ones that hadn't been fulfilled will be? Do you realize that? You know how we know the ones that will be fulfilled? Because the other ones was. So we have proof. Now, look at this prophecy. Imagine what people thought about this back when Isaiah wrote it. Isaiah himself probably didn't realize it. Verse 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. That's a prophecy. That did not happen at his first coming. That will happen at his second coming at the advent. Do you realize one day the government is going to be on his shoulder? We're finally going to get somebody in there that's going to straighten everything out. They all claim they could and none of them can. But I'm telling you, it's, he's going to one day. And look what else it says. And his name shall be called, capital W, Wonderful. That's what I'm going to preach on this morning. Counselor. He's the best counselor you'll ever have. The mighty God, he's God in the flesh. Who is it? That son, that child that was born is the mighty God, the everlasting Father. You'll not find that in Jehovah Witness Bible. The Jehovah Witnesses don't believe that Jesus was God in the flesh along with many liberal backslid uh, so-called preachers and pastors. He was the mighty God. He's the everlasting Father and he's the prince of peace. There ain't gonna be no peace on this earth until the prince of peace comes and sits on the throne and makes peace. That's a prophecy of the millennium. And look at verse number seven. Of the increase of his government and peace, there should be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from henceforth even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Bible said not only will his government be right and real, it's going to keep getting bigger and bigger forever and ever. Of the increase of his government. Have you ever wondered why God made all them planets? He's got plans for them maybe one day. Of the increase of his government, there shall be no end. It keeps on increasing forever and never has an end. I want us to look back at those descriptive phrases about the Lord Jesus there in verse 6 where it said it would be wonderful, counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Nay, I want to use that word wonderful and preach this morning on the subject, His name shall be called Wonderful. The word wonderful I looked, I mean, you, you think you know what I mean. I looked it up, and here's what the dictionary says about it. Extremely good. I would say amen to that. Amen. Marvelous, amen. Magnificent, amen. Superb, amen. Glorious, amen. Sublime, lovely, amen. Delightful, amazing, astonishing. All of those are words that the definition of wonderful you know what the Lord is this morning? He's absolutely wonderful. He is the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to preach on his name shall be called wonderful. Now that name Jesus, it was a prophesied name. It was a predetermined name. It was a proclaimed name. No other name's ever been preached like that name. It's a powerful name. There's power in that name of Jesus. It was a persecuted name. No other name is hated or loved like that name. 
It's a precious name, absolutely. And thank God it is a prevailing name. We're gonna look at that word wonderful this morning and let it describe him and his first coming and on into the second coming. Number one, he was wonderful in his birth. He was wonderful in his birth. Do you realize the Bible said a child is born? Now over there in, uh, I believe it's in chapter, uh, chapter seven, down there about verse 14, it gives you a prophecy of this. Chapter seven and verse 14 said, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. The new versions that change that to young maiden just discard that completely. That's no sign. A young woman conceiving is no sign. The sign is a virgin shall conceive. So the virgin birth was prophesied 700 years. There have been probably 10 billion people born on this planet and only one out of one out of 10 billion was born of a virgin mother. A man said that's impossible. Not with God, it's not. A man said there's no way that a woman can have a son without the physical aid of a man. Oh yeah, a virgin conceived and bore a son. Listen, that ain't no problem for God. Adam and Eve didn't have a mother or a daddy and they got here just fine and so God made this woman a virgin to have a baby. The angel told Mary, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee and the power of the highest will overshadow thee and that holy thing that shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. We studied it last Wednesday night about the deity of Christ. Every Christian here should familiarize himself with these basic doctrines of Christianity and one of the basic doctrines of Christianity is the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. What does that mean? It means Jesus Christ was God in flesh. When Mary held that baby in her arms, that was God Almighty in flesh. That baby was the everlasting Father, the mighty God, the Prince of Peace. You say, explain it. I can't. It's a mystery, but it's true and it's right. First Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 said, Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. If you have a Bible that don't say God was manifest in flesh in 1 Timothy 3.16, you have a false Bible. The Bible said God was manifest in flesh. He wasn't like God. He was God manifest in the flesh. John chapter 1 said, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word, capital W, was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Verse 14 said, The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Hallelujah, brother. He was wonderful in his birth. Nobody was ever born like he was born. And let me say, much to the dismay of the holy uh, the Jehovah Witnesses and the, and the backslid preachers, he, Jesus Christ was not a new person created. He was a preexistent person incarnated. That means he never had a beginning. That means when God made the mud seals of this world and laid the foundation of the earth, Jesus Christ was with God in the beginning, one of the third persons of the Godhead, eternal eternally existent in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and Jesus Christ was God manifest in flesh. Hallelujah. That's why we're so happy this time of year, people. His birth was wonderful. Number two, let me say secondly this morning, he was wonderful in his life. He was wonderful in his life. We don't see it, we don't know much about him from the time he was a baby and we catch up with him when he was 12 years old. When he was 12 years old, he was found in the temple there answering questions and asking questions of the doctors and they couldn't figure it out. I, I like that story. I, I've, I've told it so many times. Year at every Christmas and I love it. Uh, them doctors looked at him. They said, now, uh, kid's 12 years old. 
12 year old boy and he's in the temple here's doctors here's lawyers here's people that have studied the law of Moses all their life here's people all their life and they're looking at this kid they know there's something different about him he's just got this look he's just got this glow and one of them said uh, well uh, uh, well, who, who are you anyway what's, what's your name he said well he, he said on my mother's side uh, my name is Jesus uh, but on my father's side, I am the everlasting God, the Prince of Peace. The everlasting, they said, wait a minute, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. What, what do you mean you're the Prince? Of, you're 12 year old. That's blasphemy. And I, they said, uh, well, uh, uh, where'd you come from? He said, well, uh, on my mother's side, I come right down here in Galilee. And Bethlehem, but on my father's side, I came from the portals of heaven, right up there beside where they said, they said, well, I never heard a kid. I mean, it's awful to hear him say this, but there's just something about the way he talks. And they, they said, uh, how old are you anyway? He said, well, on my mother's side, I'm 12. But on my father's side, I'm from everlasting to everlasting. And they said, good Lord, I, I never heard nobody talk like that. And they were amazed that wouldn't you love to have just been there and had a camera of that? Glory to God. Hallelujah. 12 years old, confounding the doctor. I have the great distinct privilege of standing in front of people bragging on the only one that's ever lived a sinless life. His birth was wonderful. His life was wonderful. Don't be sad today, Christians. We flat got it made. You know, just a little bit there, Sister Caitlin. Uh, just listen, his life was wonderful. He never one time sinned. Not one time. You mean tell me a man lived 33 and a half years and never took one step out of the way? That's right. He never said one word that he had to apologize for. He never had one step, never had did one action, never over ate, never under Ate, never overslept, never, uh, I mean, he took everything absolutely perfect without sin. His life was wonderful. Pilate, if there had been something wrong with him, buddy, they'd have found it. Pilate looked at him and said, I find no fault in him. There's never been another person on this earth that you couldn't find fault with. Hallelujah, his life was wonderful. Amen. Never had to ask forgiveness for anything. I heard another fellow up in Washington said he never asked forgiveness, but he needs it bad. Jesus didn't need it, and he didn't have to ask for no forgiveness. Amen. He was wonderful in his life. But let me say number three this morning, he was wonderful in his humility. Even though he was God, even though he was God in the flesh and never sinned, he was humble. The Bible said in Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 and 8, and being found fashioned as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient. I believe he submitted to his parents. Even though he was God and they was normal people. Can you, I, can, I always would like to know how that went. Here's Jesus when he's 14. Jesus, Mary, his mother's in the kitchen. Would you run down and borrow me uh, some flour from Miss, I started to say McGillicuddy. That's off the Little Rascals. That's not a Jewish name, is it? Uh, from somebody down to uh, Solomon's wife down yonder. One of them. Uh, down yonder. Uh, they're all dead by now. Uh, but anyway, would you run down there? And Jesus is God, knowing everything, knowing she ain't home, and goes ahead and does what his mama does anyway. I meet kids all the time say, my mom just don't understand me. His mom didn't understand him either. And she done what he said. All you little brat darlings listen to me this morning? Or all, all, all y'all listen to me? He said, mama don't understand me. Well, quit, quit using that for an excuse and do what you're told and hush. Amen. Amen. Help me, mamas. I'm trying to help you. That's right. Uh, you say, mama don't understand. Well, maybe she don't. That don't give you no excuse to disobey. Jesus was obedient, being found a man. He walked the shores of Galilee and never, ever, ever, ever didn't ride a camel that we know of, didn't have a big gold chariot. He didn't have servants going in front of him, blowing trumpets and announcing his coming. Here he just came in. He didn't have big shots around him, commercial fishermen. 
Just old redneck guys from down there been pulling up, had bloody fish guts on their hands and been cut and weather-worn faces out there fishing. That's who he came into town with. Not big pomp circumstance, you know, and all this great, oh, here he comes, da 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 everybody coming. No, he was wonderful in his humility. He had nowhere to lay his head. Jesus did not have a big fine house or mansion to live in in this world. He had no fortune. He had he chose commercial fishermen to walk with. He hung out with the common people and ministered to them and preached to them. I'm telling you, brother, he was meek and lowly. I mean, he had no house. He washed the disciples' feet and humbled himself, I say to you, he was wonderful in his humility. Now you can be too good for God to use you, big for God to use you, but you can't be too little. I said you can be too big for God to use you, but you can't be too little. If you're big in your own eyes, God can't use you. So he was wonderful in his humility. Number four, he was wonderful in his compassion, touching humanity. At the grave of Lazarus, in John chapter 11, verse 35, they called Jesus one day and they said, Lord, that your buddy Lazarus is sick and I don't think he's gonna make it. And he had some stuff going on over here and didn't go right then. And during that time, Lazarus died. So when he got there, they had done had Lazarus' funeral and done buried him. He was dead, cold, uh, cold in the grave, wrapped up, laying in the tomb. And the Lord came and they said, Lord, if you'd have been here, I don't think you'd have died. Because nobody ever died in Jesus' presence. You know that, right? There's not a place in the Bible where anybody, you can't die with him around. Amen? You remember when they put that stupid little E.T., that little demon they called E.T., that bug-eyed monster looking thing and the flowers would grow when he, when he came in the room trying to imitate the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, listen, when Jesus walked up, dead people set up. They said one time, this guy was going down the road and is having his funeral and he's the only son of his mother. They had him in the casket. All the camels lined up. Everybody wearing black dresses and coats, the way they used to. Camels had their headlights on. People's pulled over up for them. And here they went. And here come Jesus. And he walks across there like that. And he walks over there and goes, dink, and touches that box. And the lid flies open. And that guy sits up and says, Whoo, mama, I'm hungry. That's, I mean, that funeral director swallowed his cigar. I'm telling you, he walked around there, come back in there, and he walked in, slammed his fist down, and said, Myrtle, I told you, make sure they're dead. That's three times this month. When he was around, nobody died, people. And he wept at the grave of Lazarus. That's his compassion. Here's God in the flesh, man standing here, and he's crying and said, I miss him. Lazarus was my buddy. He said, all right, everybody, stand back. And then he said, Lazarus, come forth. And all of a sudden, that's where they get that walking dead, mummies, vampires, zombies. Lazarus, the real deal, buddy. He come walking out of there. They clipped that thing off of him. He went in and had something to eat. He was fine. He wasn't some weird demon-looking zombie. He was alive just like me and you. He was a wonderful in his compassion. He was wonderful in his compassion. Ladies and gentlemen, he had compassion on the blind man. In Matthew chapter 20 and verse 34, Jesus had compassion. In Luke chapter 7 and verse 13, the Bible said that woman that I talked about a minute ago, he saw her and had compassion. In Matthew chapter 9 and verse 36, the Bible said when he saw the multitude, he had compassion because they had been a few days without food. I'm telling you, he was wonderful in his compassion. Number five, 
He was wonderful in his death. He was wonderful in his death. Ladies and gentlemen, he cared about people and he died for our sin. He, when they got ready to kill him, he said, for this cause came I into the world. That's why he came, to die for sinners. Jesus did not come into the world to make the world a better place to live and so you could become an environmentalist and, and a vegetarian and, and, and recycle all your paper and, and plastic. That is not why he came to the world. He came to the world to die for sinners, you and I. And brother, he was wonderful in his death. Now for this cause, he said, the Son of Man hath power to lay down his life and a power to take it up again. John chapter 10 and verse 18. He willingly submits to the mob. I preached on it many, many, many times. How that they went out there that day and there was the Lord and he's standing there and all of a sudden you could see them faces dimly lit with lanterns coming up through them bushes and there the Lord stood there knowing good and well what was getting ready to happen. He'd already prayed with his father out there in Gethsemane and done got it all settled. He was standing there a willing sacrifice for Danny and for you, for Jimmy, for Jeremy, for all of us here this morning. And they came out there that day and they said, how, how are we gonna know which one it is? It's dark out here. And Judah said, I'll show you which one. And he goes up like this and kisses Jesus on the cheek. That betrayal, that kiss. And Jesus looked at him and said, friend, where are you going? Called him friend, knowing good and well he was a traitor. Judas took that 30 pieces of silver that they sold him for and took off down through the bushes somewhere. And they grabbed him like this. And they grabbed him down to the judgment hall. Peter took out his sword and was getting ready to kill that guy. Cut his ear off, actually. And buddy, his ear hit the ground. Jesus said, put it up, put it up, put it up, Peter. We don't need that right now. The time's coming when you will, but not now. Just leave it alone. All the disciples got scared and took off running through the bushes and they grabbed the Lord and took him down there and stripped his clothes off. And then they took a whip. They took a whip. You've heard it preached over and over and over. How did they have those? Probably those cat of nine tails or something like that. And it had sharp bits of rock or glass in that whip. And they laid him up there. They'd tie him up like that, tie his hands to the wall, lay him there with his clothes off. And it'd take that big Roman soldier, would take that whip and go slap. And buddy, they slapped him and jerked that thing back and it cut his guts out around here. Many times when they did that, uh, the victim died just from the scourging. They called that scourging. You know what the Old Testament said? They plowed up his back. Like you'd take a tiller and plow up the ground. They plowed his back. That was for the beer you drank. That was for the cuss word you said. That was for the movies you watched. They plowed his back, people. That's why we ought to love him. That's why we ought to serve him. Amen. That's the greatest story ever told. That's why we need to pray. That's why we need to bring our children to church. He was wonderful. Thank God in his death. They took him to the cross. They slapped him in the face and spit in his face and covered his face with her spit. And they led him up there and there he was. That old cruel, ugly, rugged cross. And they laid the Lord Jesus down. They didn't overpower him. He had power. He could have called 10,000 angels and put every one of them on a cross if he didn't want to do. But he put out there and he stuck that hand out that big Roman soldier held his hand down. Another one took a great big hammer like a sledgehammer, put that spike right in there at the top of his hand and beat and beat through into that wood. Both hands, both feet. Jesus had him laid there. They took that pole and they raised it up like that with him on it and they pushed and they pushed and they pushed and it finally got so high and just fell into that hole. And the pain after his back was already plowed up. 
the blood from the crown of thorns running down his face. I'm telling you, he looked out that day 2,000 years into the future into a little place called Nebo, North Carolina. Saw an 18-year-old boy laying on his face needing help and said, I'm going to do this just for him. Hallelujah. Thank God. If I'd have been the only sinner, he would have laid down his life for me and he'd have done it for you. He was wonderful in his death, people. When he was on the cross, he uttered seven sayings. Number one, Luke 23, 33, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Number two, verily I say unto you, today you'll be with me in paradise to the thief. Luke 23. Number three, woman, behold thy son. Tell him, Mary, to go home with John. John chapter 19. My God, number four, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Matthew 27, 45 and 6. Number five, I thirst. Number six, it is finished. And number seven, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And he went home to be with the Lord. His spirit went to God. His body went in the tomb. His soul went into the lower parts of the earth to empty out paradise. Tell the greatest story. I'm telling you, nobody ever died a death like that. Number six, he is, present tense. This other stuff I've been talking about is past. Present tense, he is wonderful in his intercession for me and you. He came up from the grave. He did not stay dead. Amen, amen. He, that's why all that stuff was uh, borrowed. The only thing he ever owned was the clothes on his back and that cross and crown. Somebody said it like this. Just a tad, please. They borrowed a bed to lay his head when Christ the Lord came down. They borrowed the ass in the mountain to pass for him to ride to town. But the crown that he wore and the cross that he bore was his own. Yes, the cross was his own. He borrowed the bread when the crowd he fed on the grassy mountainside. He borrowed the fish and the broke of the dish of which he satisfied. But the crown that he wore and the cross that he bore were his own. The cross was his own. He borrowed the ship in which to sit to teach the multitude. He borrowed the nest in which to rest because he never had a home so crude. But the crown that he wore and the cross that he bore were his own. The cross was his own. He borrowed a room on his way to the tomb, the Passover lamb to eat. They borrowed a cave for him a grave, and they borrowed a winding sheet. But the cross that he bore, the crown that he wore, were his own. Yes, the cross was his own. He's wonderful in his intercession. What does that mean? Do you know what intercession means? Intercession is what a lawyer does for you. You got somebody over here and you got a problem, here's the judge. A lawyer intercedes between you and the judge. A lawyer pleads your case. A lawyer says, look, I'm gonna represent this man over here and uh, he done this and we're gonna try to help him to get past this thing here, da, 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 da. That's what intercession means. Intercession is a middleman, a go-between. I'm telling you, right now, according to that book, Right now, he sits in heaven making intercession for us. Amen. I'm telling you, buddy. Listen, he said, you know what I told Peter? He said, I prayed for you that your faith fail not. Listen, maybe he's prayed for me. Maybe he's prayed for you. That makes me feel a little confident this morning that I've got him praying for me. Lord, I want y'all to pray for me, and I appreciate it. But think about him making intercession for you and I. He's wonderful. Oh, yes, he lived a perfect life, and he got crucified. During the French Revolution, there was a, some of those big leaders told one of the bishops, he said, uh, he said, well, good night. Christianity ain't so hot. He said, anybody can start a religion like that. that Jesus just went and started that religion. And the bishop said, oh, yeah, 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 you can. All you got to do is live a perfect, sinless life, get crucified, and rise again. 
Anybody can do it. The truth is, nobody did it but him. Muhammad didn't do it. Buddha didn't do it. They're dead in hell if, if they didn't get saved. And I'm telling you this morning, he ever liveth to make intercession for us. Yesterday, yesterday, the bus ministry. So one reason why you should go on bus ministry once in a while is to help you stay in touch with reality. Yesterday, I talked to a, a dear lady, bless her heart, I had no groceries, and I went and got her a few things and took her to them. I talked to a woman yesterday, and she was like this. She said, thank you so much for bringing these girls. And I'm not trying to be ugly or make fun of her. It was drugs. Like a demon had a hold of her. Yesterday, on bus route, Kelly. Yeah, it's Kelly. You know my wife, you know, that takes the babies and goes on bus route every Saturday? There's your excuse, gone. Baby. They was out visiting most of the day yesterday on their way home. A car passed them, flew in behind another car and flew around this other car and she said, I knew. She, she said, he was riding their bumper. She said, I knew he was going to hit them and rammed right into the back of that car. Well, they had to stop. People got out of both cars, started screaming and hollering and cussing. I you blankety blank, 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 you know, this. And, and she said, this girl jumped out of the car and started walking. She rolled down the window and said, ma'am, can I help you? And she said, no, he's just mad because uh, uh, my baby's daddy's in the car with me and he don't like it and that's my boyfriend. And blah. Just a big mess, screaming, hollering, cussing, kids having to live in that stuff. You would not believe some of the stories we heard yesterday, just yesterday, of what kids are living in. You wouldn't believe it. Jesus died and rose again and make an intercession for them people. He cares about them. He cares about them. Just yesterday, there was another, another situation they told us about. They were sad. Just this morning, when I walked in this morning, a little four-year-old girl back yonder somewhere, I don't even know her name, you would not believe it would make you sick to your stomach if you knew what she'd come out of just this morning. Thank God, thank God there's somebody that cares about this old sin-cursed world and make an intercession for it. I was at Walmart, took Brother Wayne, gave him some groceries Friday, and somebody, a girl run in the back of a truck over there, and they was out in the parking lot just cussing filthy, dirty words out there hollering and screaming. I thought, buddy, you know what? This world is rotten, people. But thank God there's somebody going to straighten it out one day. And that's number seven, and I'm through. He will be wonderful when he comes again. First Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. That ain't the last trump. That ain't, a, that, that, ain't, that ain't the last trumpet, I should say. A trump is a sound a trumpet makes. A trumpet is a different sound than the voice of the Lord. He's coming with the voice of the Lord. And brother, when he comes, we're gonna rise to meet him in the air. He's gonna be wonderful when he comes again. Listen, he's not gonna send an angel. He's not gonna sit up there and say, well, about time to bring the church home, y'all. Well, one of you angels mind going down there and getting them from me? Nope. When a man goes and gets his bride, he don't let nobody else do it. He does it himself. For the Lord himself, he's coming on his own, in his time, in his own power. And he's coming, and he's coming, he's coming down one day. Notice the sign. Now, you've heard me say it before. When you're going to, let's say you're going to Atlanta, you go down here and hit the Interstate 85, you're driving towards Atlanta. You're going to see a sign. It'll say, I'm guessing, uh, Atlanta, 185. Uh, then you, then few, about 10 miles later, Atlanta, 175. Maybe 20 miles later, Atlanta, 155. And then as you start getting closer and closer to Atlanta, the signs are more frequent and they're, they're bigger. And it'll say, Atlanta, only 35 miles. Atlanta, and then it's just constant, one sign after another sign. And by the time you almost get to the city limits, I mean, it's built, you can't even read them all. There's so many on both sides of you'd wreck trying to read all them signs. That's the same way 
it is with the coming of the Lord. For years and years and years, there'd be a sign here. There'd be a sign there. There'd be a sign here. There'd be a sign there. All earthquakes, famines, wars, rumors of wars, uh, all, all the, the sodomy and the, and the laws changing and the forsaking of the law and the apostasy of churches and all of that. And brother, as we're getting closer, the signs are happening so fast now, you can't even read them all. I, I, every time I get an updated version of the signs of the time, there's new stuff. I'm gonna give you some next Sunday, Lord willing. There's stuff coming out on the mark of the beast, the microchip, all of that stuff's happening so fast now. You realize now it's happening in America that companies are putting chips in their employees' hands and we're quickly moving toward a time when you'll do your, all your business with a computer chip in your hand. You believe that? It's coming one of these days. You say, well, people will never accept it. They will after the emergency. They won't now, but they will after emergency. And emergency's coming. I'm telling you, the signs are everywhere. He's going to be wonderful in his coming. They said this one time. They said, this old preacher is up preaching on the second coming. And he's preaching, he's clapped his hand, he said, the Lord said, when he comes, it'll be just like that. And when he did that, a big old light up in the top of that big high church just come loose and fell and busted right in the middle of the floor. And he said, bam! And everybody went like that. He said, he said, it'll be just like that. Just that quick. When you're not expecting him, when you're not looking for him. You know, let, me, let me tell you what the world has in mind. If you're not a Christian, here's what your hope is. They say, some German scientist, they're supposed to be brilliant, has now figured out that there are probably at least 10 civilized planets like ours within a thousand light years from us. How he come to that conclusion, nobody knows. But he said there's probably 10 civilized planets just like this that happened, because this didn't happen by accident. That same accident could have happened 10 times within a thousand light years of us. And they say the only hope for our species is to finally make contact with one of them planets that has survived a nuclear war and see how they made it and get advice from them. What do you think the chances are First, of finding another planet. I'm just, I'm just kidding right now. You know, there ain't no such thing. There ain't no people on other planets. There's demons and stuff out there flying around. There's a prince of power there, but there ain't no people nowhere but here. Heaven is his throne. Earth is his footstool. There ain't no people nowhere but here and heaven and hell. You listening? None. What's the chances of us finding another planet that's populated that communicates like we do and can talk and that has had nuclear war and that has survived and is nice enough to tell us how they did it. You know what that basically says for this world? There is no hope. There is no hope. The Bible said him coming is our blessed hope. There is no hope besides him. I'll tell you this and I'm through. He said one cold Christmas day, Christmas Eve, it was in a big city and the snow was blowing, the wind was blowing, it was so crazy, like it was last Sunday, that wind, man, it's, it's when, I, it, when I was driving out Sunday, it was, it was going sideways like a blizzard, you couldn't even see. And it was like that and it was bad in a real big city and it was Christmas and people were rushing about and they were going back and buying stuff this poor little boy, pitiful, didn't hardly have no, hardly no shoes or, uh, that, that were falling apart, old raggedy shoes and clothes. And his family was real poor and wasn't going to get nothing for Christmas. And he'd go downtown and he'd just look in the window at them toys. Back when they used to have the old five, ten, five and ten store, you know, the dime store people used to call it a long time ago. And he'd stand there and he'd look at them toys and he'd just imagine how wonderful it'd be to have one of them toys and play with it. 
And every day before Christmas, he'd just go down there and stare at it like that and wish he had a toy like some of the other kids. And one day a rich man came down the street, a man that was well off, and he saw that little boy. And he asked the owner of the store, he said, what's that kid doing? He said, he comes down here every day and just looks through that window at them toys. And he stares at that little, that little wagon or that little something that he liked. And the rich man says, here, I'll pay for it. Take it out there and give it to him. And he paid for that then. And they took that out there and they gave it to that little boy and said, here, son. And the little boy said, huh? He said, this is yours. You can play with it. He said, no glass between. There ain't no glass between me and I can touch it. He said, that's right, it's yours. And he went home saying, now there's no glass between. Now, let me tell you what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13. He said, now we see through a glass darkly. <laughs> right now, we live for the Lord, we serve the Lord, we go to church every Sunday and we just sort of see through a smoke glass, you know, just get a glimpse every now and then. But let me tell you, glory to God, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. One of these blessed days, people. One of these glad mornings. One of these great hours. He'll come and he'll say, hey, I love you. We'll say, no glass between. There ain't no glass between. I can see him. I can touch him. I can be with him forever. He'll be wonderful when he comes again. His name shall be called Wonderful. The mighty God. Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Let's stand by our heads for prayer. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. Every head bowed and every eye closed. The best gift you could receive for Christmas would be eternal life through Jesus Christ. If you're not saved here this morning, the Bible said the gift of God. People don't believe in gifts. I'm glad God did. I'm glad God so loved the world that he gave. I'm glad the Bible said, thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. I'm glad the Bible said, uh, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. She's playing softly this morning. If you're here this morning, you've never been saved. You don't know what it means to be saved. Please, come and get right this morning. If you're here this morning and you're a Christian, you ain't been living like you should live. You're missing out on life's greatest privilege. That is knowing him and being right with the Lord. We're gonna pray on the first verse of this song. Come get out of your seat. Some of you ladies can pray. These girls coming. Maybe you need to come this morning. Maybe, maybe you need to come this morning. Get your heart right. Get your attitude right. God will help you this morning. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for that scripture that said your name will be called Wonderful. We thank you this morning, Lord, for giving us just a little glimpse through a glass darkly of your wondrous grace and mercy. I pray, God, your will will be done here this morning. Do what ought to be done. Save that one which is lost. Touch every single heart, and we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray, and for his sake, amen and amen. We're singing this morning. If you need to come, young man, couples, husbands, wives, come on right now. Amen. Yeah, you come on right now. Mamas and daddies, come on right now. Amen. That's right, that's right. Come on and sing it. Amen. He, the Lord, he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. All right, let's everybody sing. Come on home. Ready? Come home. Say, come. Amen. 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 Somebody pray this way, man. Yeah. Let God help you this morning. Let God help you this morning. You need to come? Come on right now. Come on right now. Earnestly Jesus is calling. Amen. Amen. Sing it, brother. Let's sing, everybody, everybody now. Why should we do Amen, amen. That's right. Bleeding for you and for me. Come on now, sing it. Bye.
somebody. Come on now, sing now. Come on home. Come home. Amen. everything right now. Amen. A uh, couple things right quick now. Don't miss tonight. It's the greatest play on earth here tonight. There's no telling what you're liable to see and hear tonight. So don't miss it. Don't miss it. I can't wait. Uh, everybody in the play be here at 4 o'clock and then uh, Wednesday of course our regular service and then Thursday night